It now gives me great pleasure to introduce you to our next keynote speaker. She's spoken at the TTA forum before, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome her back. It's no other than uh, Milena Nikolova, and she's a leading expert in behavior smart thinking for the travel industry. And she has extensive international experience across four continents. She is the author of the first ever book published on behavioral economics for the travel sector. In her work, Milena seeks to apply insights from psychology to offer human-centered explanations for complex issues in the travel sector. She is also a great advocate for people-smart innovations which can help address them. Her keynote is entitled Recovery Through Happiness. So, can a human-centered approach reinvent travel on its way to recovery? Well, we shall soon find out. Milena, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you, Charlotte. It's a true pleasure to be here and to share with you a hopefully inspiring and certainly a very positive um, way of thinking that I hope we could apply to the recovery of the travel industry, which has uh, experienced one of the biggest disruptions in the last years, but which I propose has an opportunity to recover in a way that can make even bigger impact for us as uh, stakeholders in the industry, for our travelers who are our clients, but also um, for societies that we are all members of. So here's the journey that I would like to take you through today. Um, Charlotte kindly shared a few uh, words about my background, um, but I will share a little bit about my profile and then offer a very quick overview of what is behavior smart thinking, which is uh, the field that I have been working in for a few years. Then I'll introduce to you um, a concept that I propose can offer an interesting perspective to the recovery of tourism industry and how we can apply behavior smart thinking in a way that hasn't been applied so far. And then discuss with you what are some of the hidden powers of travel when it comes to making people happy and how we can lean on them in order to fuel recovery and market success for our industry. At the end of the presentation um, of my talk, I will share with you a concept which I hope will be inspiring and exciting for you um, in a similar manner that it has been for me and the colleagues that I have been working with. So Charlotte was kind enough to share uh, a little bit about my background, so I'm not going to spend much, much more time on that, but I wanted to highlight the fact that uh, my uh, career has merged my expertise in uh, behavioral sciences, in psychology, with my passion for tourism um, and sustainability. So in the last decade or so, I have focused my uh, energy, intellectual power and time on bringing uh, these fields together and creating new ways of thinking about uh, making the, that hopefully make the industry more powerful, more effective and more sustainable in the way that it makes a difference to us as players in the industry, to the places and communities that are at the core of the experiences that we offer uh, in tourism and to the traveler um, who is our client and uh, who we want to impact uh, in the best possible way. So what is behavior smart thinking? Behavior smart thinking is inspired by a relatively new field of knowledge called behavioral economics. And behavioral economics has been on the rise in the last couple of decades. Um, and it has been fueled by the insights that we and science has been generating about human psychology and behavior and applying that new knowledge to understanding better why and how people make certain decisions and take certain actions across different situations uh, that are part of everyday life. 
it has also uh, inspired the development and creation of new solutions, a new way of thinking that resolve some of our complex societal and business challenges um, by aligning the solutions with the realistic behavioral patterns and the way psychology really works. And ultimately, behavioral economics has been advancing the paralleling of solutions and um, uh, business modeling with the way that people really make decisions and act in order to achieve more efficiency and effectiveness in the way that um, we approach challenges. The field has been so significant in making a difference across different important socioeconomic contexts that only in the last 15 years we have seen three Nobel Prizes in economics go to prominent behavioral economists. So what are some of the areas in which behavioral economics has made a difference? It has inspired better understanding um, and also solutions in areas such as healthy living. And it explains why is it that at a time when we have so much um, scientific evidence about what are the best ways to maintain a healthy lifestyle, we, we continue to see rise in the share of um, uh, lifestyle related uh, health problems that our contemporary societies are dealing with. In the last year, we have also sort of um, uh, being the witnesses of one of the biggest natural and unplanned experiments that demonstrated that sometimes not understanding what might be the true motivators and powers guiding human behavior might lead to crises that make it difference to encourage people, to motivate people, to apply some simple acts to protect their own health and the health of others. So not understanding the exact forces and the exact factors has demonstratedly been at the heart of um, many challenges that countries around the world have faced in managing the current crisis. Behavioral economics has also really improved our understanding of some of the irrational behaviors and decisions that people in contemporary um, uh, societies make when it comes to spending and financial behavior. And um, it has also inspired some very innovative and human-centered innovations, which make it easier to encourage people to make the, wise and the, the wiser and more um, beneficial decisions for them and their own lives. And another area in which uh, we've seen behavioral economics really gain prominence and make an impact relates to what I would like to talk to you today. And that's understanding what is it? What are the factors? that make people more happy and increase their sense for satisfaction from life. What does behavior smart thinking um, um, bring to the context of travel? I wanna give you a few examples um, of the types of challenges uh, that are being addressed uh, with behavioral economics uh, insights. So some of the problems that the behavioral economist or a behavioral specialist in the context of travel finds themselves solving today um, is to outline how the current pandemic is changing everyday behaviors of people and what that will mean for their behavior in the future as travelers. We know that the crisis has left very deep marks on human behavior. And so part of what the behavioral expert can do in the context of travel is help destinations and businesses adjust uh, their operations in order to be more prepared for the different type of traveler that they can expect after the crisis. Another type of intervention that is frequent for a behavioral specialist is re helping businesses redesign their offerings, the experiences and the services that they offer in order to make sustainability a non-negotiable element in them and minimize the likelihood that their clients will actually opt for the less sustainable option. 
Um, another interesting tasks, task for a behavioral specialists today is to work with destinations to understand the behavior of guests much better in order to make it the basis for segmenting and profiling the types of travelers that they really want to attract. And also supporting um, destination authorities or policy institutions in order to design policies that nudge local operators and entrepreneurs to optimize the footprint of their operations. In other words, to design policies that help make the local tourism economy more sustainable and uh, optimal in terms of footprint. So in this context, after I have given you the overview of what is behavior smart thinking, I would like to invite you to join me in discussing the opportunity of using some of these insights for what I call um, the reverse responsibility that we have the opportunity to demonstrate. And what does that mean? So as I shared with you, um, the more common way in which we have been applying uh, behavioral knowledge, which has been um, advancing in the last years, is to use insights about how people make decisions and how they act in order to figure out how to make travelers more responsible towards our industry, places, communities. But what if that very knowledge about human psychology, about our traveler psychology, can help us as an industry magnify the impact that we as an industry have on travelers and their lives. Let me tell you what I mean. I think that all of us can agree that the COVID-19 pandemic and the crisis that it has triggered in our industry has made it almost impossible to imagine that a responsible tourism company would operate without caring for the well-being of travelers and local clients, staff and collaborators, as well as local residents. Caring for the well-being of all of the players, all people that are within the tourism ecosystem is now becoming almost a permanent element of what basic quality in our industry will be. So it's a must have element that the crisis has put on our plate. And while we focus on physical well being, or the crisis has almost forced us to focus um, with new attention on, on physical well being, this is one, only one dimension of how we understand well being. The second dimension of human well being is what we call perceived well being or sense of happiness. So my proposition to you is that since we are anyway focused now and reorganized to handle one of the dimensions of human being, physical well-being and health, why don't we take that extra step and also consider taking care of perceived well-being, of happiness, in order to really contribute to um, an effort and a trend which we have started seeing even before the crisis. And that's to make societies not only focused on economic success, but rather on well being, human success, on happiness. Why does that make sense for, for tourism and for tourism businesses, especially today uh, in this crisis? It makes sense for us as an industry because actually, we have the knowledge, the expertise, and the tool set to influence happiness more than uh, many, many other industries. And this creates an opportunity that I would like to argue we should grab. There's uh, an enormous volume of research into what are the factors that make people happier. Um, but some of them I have listed here just to demonstrate that we really have the power to influence happiness. And actually without that much effort and without that much additional resources. So I have listed here four factors that I will review with you. 
uh, and that are, have proven impact on human happiness. Relationships and quality time with close ones, health and satisfaction with physical well-being, reconnection with nature and the outdoors, and the sense of personal growth and achievement. As I mentioned, I truly believe, and I'm sure that most of you would agree, that we as an industry have the power to easily um, employ these factors in order to benefit our recovery and market success in the post-crisis period, but also to make a contribution to societies and to the individuals who choose to travel with us. So relationships and time spent with people um, that we value and love is one of the most powerful way to encourage a sense of happiness and satisfaction with life. So what if we as an industry, through some small adjustments in the design of our products and services, can encourage more high quality relationships and appreciation of being with close ones? How can we do that? What if we can frame itineraries and experiences around togetherness and time for family and friends? And that's, that's something that I've already seen some innovative and um, front-running companies do. Design itineraries that are specifically an invitation to spend quality time with um, the closest friends or with closest family and to create memories together with them. Another technique is to adjust itineraries and service design to simply incorporate moments that offer time for spending quality time together or for mindful interaction. These can only also be encouraged um, by using reinterpretation, gamification and small nudges here and there that encourage um, travelers to spend time together, to engage in joint activities, to experience joint, joint, fun, joint fun. Um, and to engage together in um, some simple but mindful experiences. In addition, and um, this is a trend that has already, uh, that our industry is already familiar with, we can softly impact and create space for relationship time by putting in gentle barriers for technology use that remove technology and devices uh, as barriers to interaction and actually create space for my more high quality interactions. So you can see here, I've listed four examples of techniques which are not difficult to introduce and that most of us have previous experience with that can have a powerful effect on the sense of togetherness and relationship among our travelers. Let's focus on the second factor that impacts that can impact happiness and how we can strengthen the sense of physical well-being and health. One thing is, of course, to design and package programs and experiences which are shaped around wellness, rejuvenation, mindfulness. This has been a rising trend even before the crisis, but now with the new emphasis on welfare and human well-being, there will be demand for such specialized offerings even more so. So there's definite opportunity, not only for impact, but also for market success. We can also simply emphasize healthy and feel good options in the existing uh, itineraries that we offer. Sometimes we place um, a focus on incorporating local food or local ingredients, local spices. And not only are they interesting in many cases because they relate to local traditions, but they're in many cases healthier, powerful, containing more vitamins. So simply conveying this information to our travelers can actually give them uh, the sense that they're not only consuming an exciting experience, but they're actually consuming something that's good for their body. Highlighting benefits of what is already included through interpretation and education, making sure that some small details, such as the fresh air or the small physical activity that's part of the today's uh, experience, 
are actually good, not only for the mind, but also for the body. And something that, again, relates to a trend that was already uh, visible in our industry, creating moments, even if not entire programs, that offer the opportunity for a digital detox or that offer an opportunity for moments without technology. We have an increasing amount of evidence of the negative impact of technology on human well-being and um, human welfare. And this is especially important when people are on their holiday and they're seeking to get away from the busy daily life um, that they're leading otherwise. Connected to that, um, our experiences that relate to being outdoors and nature. What if we can encourage physical and spiritual re rejuvenation by emphasizing the outdoors and natural spaces in our offerings. And of course, one of the ways to do that is to simply design and offer experiences and itineraries which are completely shaped around being outdoors and reconnecting with nature. A small note that I would like to make here is that the current crisis has made, such has given prominence to the outdoors as a way of rejuvenating and recovering after the lockdowns that all of us have experienced. But the important thing here is that we have a very large audiences of travelers who don't have previous experience with being outdoors. So one of the ways in which we can facilitate this welcome trend is to actually support and offer the services and the nudges and the education that these audiences need in order to be able to enjoy the outdoors and nature and be prepared to do so in a safe manner. Even if we don't design specific outdoors itineraries, we can still emphasize nature and the outdoors in non-specific programs. Sometimes something as small as giving um, travelers uh, information about an interesting plant or interesting um, uh, animal species which is found in the uh, surrounding area might make them more mindful towards connecting uh, to, to the greenery around them and the landscapes around them. Short information about the landscapes and offering places where they can enjoy the outdoors and nature um, is something that can make a big difference and can make them more mindful to nature around them, even if this is not the emphasis of the experience. You know, the crisis actually is giving us a nudge to use more um, out, to use the outdoors more often as venue, whether it's for outdoor seating, uh, for food experiences, or simply by encouraging people to be more to spend more time outside um, through creating special viewing points or terraces and so on, is again um, something small that we can do to facilitate that. Um, reconnection uh, with outdoor spaces. And as I mentioned, we as operators, as businesses, can do some small things um, to encourage guests to get out and connect with nature, experience the outdoors, but be prepared for that. So some small tips for those who don't have experience with our landscapes and our nature in our destination could include what to wear, what to bring, um, how much time to spend, what might be the weather pat patterns. Some small tips like that can really make a big difference in helping people rediscover nature that they have lost relationship to. And then the final factor that I wanted to suggest uh, could be something that we could easily influence relates to the sense of personal growth and achievement. And how can we do that? One of the ways is, of course, to design itineraries and package experiences that involve learning or new experiences that bring that sense of self-actualization, of doing something that you haven't done before, of something that makes you better, more knowledgeable, more skillful. Part of that is also to incorporate opportunities for experiencing challenges. It's really important that 
we incorporate challenges which are manageable and not too stressful so that we don't produce a negative experience, but rather bring in the right um, amount of challenge that leads to an achievement. And of course, very importantly, use these small moments to celebrate achievements and growth. So whether it's a small badge or simply capturing the moment of much achievement with a memory, with a video, with a photo, um, uh, are all small things that we can do in order to really mark um, that experience that's, that carries personal growth satisfaction. So I hope that with this series of small examples, I have been able to demonstrate to you that yes, we can, as an industry, we can come back after one of the biggest crises that we have recovered in a way that can make people and ultimately societies better off. And we can do that by contributing to their physical well-being, but also that important sense of happiness, which all of us are pursuing. And we can do that by creating time and space for relationships and sense of togetherness by supporting the physical welfare of our travelers, by inspiring a return to nature, which has unquestionable rejuvenation powers, and by serving as an industry, as a platform for personal growth and development. So with this, I would like to close by proposing that if we as an industry embrace this newly new and fresh emphasis on human well-being and human welfare, we could be moving to a renewed approach to sustainability and responsible business in our industry. So in addition with balancing environmental effects, social effects and economic effects, we would be producing human well-being effects and balancing all of these will inspire new energy and new powers to our sector, which can not only make, which will not only make a strong recovery after the current crisis, but which will produce new powerful effects on our societies as a whole. So with this idea, I would like to thank you for the attention and of course, invite questions and comments. I look forward to leading a dialogue on these ideas with you. Thank you very much, Milena. What a wonderful insight and, and really very fresh off the press. Obviously, this is the third time that you have been with us. And I would like to uh, once again, thank you for, for joining us at ITB Berlin now in 2021. Um, I can say to our audience that I know Milena is always very, very happy to answer feedback and engage with the crowd. So please do find her here on the ITB platform and put all of your questions to her, which I know that she will be excited to see. There is so much insight there and so much food for thought. Um, this concludes the morning program here at the TTA Forum. And we, of course, look forward to seeing you back in the afternoon for a very engaging program as well. We have some key stats coming up from Arrival and the co-founder, Douglas Quimby. There are two major interactive panels with Merlin Entertainment, Smart Guide, Viator, Grey Line Worldwide, and City Nomadi. So you have much to look forward to this afternoon. In the meantime, we would love for you to check out the ITP program elsewhere and just take in some of the sessions uh, in the course of the next few hours. And you are also very, very welcome to join the TTA Cafe, where you can meet all of our experts and get together with like-minded peers. So all that remains for me is to thank Milena once again for her wonderful keynote. Thank you, Milena. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me here. It's been my absolute pleasure and that of our audience, I can guarantee it. And to everybody else, we look forward to seeing you later again. Thanks for joining.